Ashley Brock reading Nora Roberts' book, Inner Harbor, Chapter 1. Philip loosened the Windsor knot in his feeny tie. It was a long commute from Baltimore to Maryland's Easter Shore, and he programmed his CD player with that in mind. He started out mellow with a little Tom Petty and the Heartbreakers. Thursday evening traffic was as bad as predicted, made worse by the sluggish rain and the rubberneckers who couldn't resist a long, fascinating Google at the three-car accident on the Belt Baltimore Beltway. By the time he was heading south on Route 50, even in the hot licks of a vintage stones, couldn't complete completely lift his mood. He brought work with him and somehow had to eke out time for the Me Meyerstone Tire account over the weekend. They wanted a whole new look for this advertising campaign. Happy tires make happy drivers. Phil Top drumming his fingers on the wheel to the rhythm of Keith Richardson's outlaw guitar, which was a crock. He decided nobody was happy driving in a rainy rush hour traffic, no matter what rubber covered their tires. But he'd come up with something that would make the customers think that riding on mil milestones would make them half safe and sexy. It was his job, and he was good at it. Good enough to juggle four major accounts, supervise the status of six lesson ones, and never appear to break a sweat. Within the slick corridors of innovations, and well-heeled advertising firm where he worked, the firm that demanded style, exuberance, and creativity for its executives. They didn't pay him to see him sweat. Alone, however, was a different matter. He knew he'd been burning not a candle but a torch at both ends for months. With one hard slap of fate, he'd gone from living for Philip Quinn to wondering what had happened to his cheerful, upworldly mobile urban lifestyle. His father died six months before, had turned his life upside down, left a rain stuck on head right in right in seventeen years ago. They'd walked into that judgy hospital room and offered him a chance and a choice. Taking the chance because he'd been smart enough to understand that he had no choice. Going back on the streets wasn't as appealing as it had been, for his chest had been ripped open by bullets. Living with his mother was no longer an option, not even if she changed her mind and let him buy his way back into the cramped apartment on Baltimore's block. Social services was taking a hard look at the situation, and he knew he'd be dumped into the system the minute he was back on his feet. He had no intention of going back into the system or back with his mother, or back to the gutter, for that matter. He already decided that. He felt that all he needed was a little time to work out a plan. At that moment, that time was buffeted by some very fine drugs that had he hadn't had to pay or steal, but he didn't figure that little benefit was going to last forever. With the Geminol sliding through his system, he gave the Quins a candy once over and dismissed them as a couple weird old do That was fine with him. They wanted to be Samaritans to give him a place to hang out until he's back to 100%. Good for them good for him. They told him they had a house on the eastern shore, which for an inner city kid was the other end of the world. But he figured it changed the scene. The scene couldn't hurt. They had two sons about his age. Phil decided he wouldn't have to worry about a couple of wimps that the do-gooders had raised. They told him they had rules and education was a priority. School didn't bother him any. He breezed his way through it when he decided to go. No drugs. Tell us said that in a cool voice that made Philip reevaluate her as put on his most angelic expression and said a polite no ma'am. He had no doubt that when he wanted a hit, he'd be able to find a source, even if some bum fuck town on the bay. Then Stella leaned over the bed, her eyes shrewd, her mouth smiled tinny. You have a feast that belongs on a Renaissance painting, but that doesn't make you less of a thief, a hoodlum, and a liar. We'll help you if you want to be helped, but don't treat us like imbeciles. And Ray laughed his big booming laugh, squeezed Stella's shoulder and Phillips at the same time. It would be, Philip remembered, he said, a rare treat to watch the two of them butt heads for four the next little while. They came back several times over the next two weeks. Phil talked with them and with the social worker who'd been much easier to con than the Quins. In the end, they took him home from the hospital to the pretty white house by the water. He met their sons, assessed the situation. When he learned that the other boys, Cameron and Eastman, had been taken as much as he had, he was certain they were all lunatics, figured on buying his time. For a doctor and a college professor, they hadn't collected an audience of easily stolen, stolen or fenced valuables, but he scooped out what there was. Instead of stealing from them, he fell in love with them took their name the next ten years in the house by the water. Then Stella had died. Part of his world dropped away. She had become the mother he'd never believed existed. Steady, strong, loving, and shrewd. He grieved for her, the first true loss of his life. 
He buried part of that grief and work, pushing his way through college toward a goal of success and a sheen of sophistication and an inner level position at Innovations. He didn't intend to remain on the bottom rung for long. Taking a position at Innovations in Baltimore was a small personal tribe. He was going back to the city of his misery, but he was going back as a man of taste. No one seeing the man in the tailor suit would suspect that he once been a petty thief, a sometime drug dealer, an occasional prostitute. Everything he gained over the last seventeen years could be traced back to the moment when Ray Stella Quinn had walked into his hospital room. Then Ray had died suddenly, leaving shadows that had yet to be washed with the light. The man Philip had loved as completely as son could love a father had lost his life on a quiet stretch of road in the middle of the day when his car had met a telephone pole at high speed. There was another hospital room. This time it was the mighty Quinn line broken in the bed with machines gasping. Philip, along with his brothers, had made a promise to watch out for and to keep the last of Ray's Quinn strays, another lost boy. But this boy had secrets, and he looked at you with Ray's eyes. Talk around the waterfront in the new neighborhoods of the little town of St. Christopher's on Maryland's eastern shore hinted of adultery, a suicide, of scandal. Six months since the whispers had started, Phil felt that he and his brothers had gotten no closer to finding the truth. Who was Seth DeLotner, and what had he been to Raymond Quinn? Another stray, another half-grown down boy drowning on a vicious sea of neglect and violence who... So desperately needed a lifeline, or was he more? A quin by blood as well as by circumstances. All Philip could be sure of was that ten year old Seth was his brother as much as Cam and Ethan were his brothers. Each of them had been snatched out of a nightmare and given a chance to change their lives. With Seth, Ray and Stella weren't there to keep that choice open. There was a part of Philip, a part that had lived inside a young, careless sleep, that resented even the possibility that Seth could be raised son by blood, son conceived in adultery and abandoned in shame. It would be a betrayal of everything the Quinns had taught him, everything they had shown him by living their lives as they had. He detested himself for considering it, for knowing that now and then he studied Seth with cool, praising eyes and wondered the boy's existence was the reason Ray Quinn was dead. Whatever that nasty thought crapped into his mouth, fit to Whenever that nasty thought crept into his mind, Philip shifted his concentration to Gloria DeLautner. Seth's mother was the woman who had accused Professor Raymond Quinn of sexual harassment. She claimed it had happened years before while she was a student at the university, but there was no record of her ever attending classes there. The same woman had sold her ten-year-old son to Ray as if he'd been a package of meat. The same woman, Philip was certain, that Ray had been to Baltimore to see before he had driven home and driven himself to his death. She'd taken off. Women like Gloria were skilled in skipping out of harm's way. Weeks ago, she sent the twins a not-so-subtle blackmail letter. If you want to keep the kid, I need more. Philip's jaw clenched when he remembered the naked fear on Seth's face when he learned of it. She wasn't going to get her hands on the boy, he told himself. She was going to discover that the Quinn brothers were a tougher mark than one soft-hearted old man. Not just the Quinn brothers now either he thought as he turned off onto the royal country road that would lead him home he thought of family as he drove fast down a road flanked by fields of soybeans of peas of corn growing taller than a man now that cam and ethan were married such that two determined women the same with him as well married Philip shook his head in amused wonder. Who would have thought it? Cameron hitched himself to the sexy social worker, and Ethan was married to sweet-eyed Grace and had become an instant father. Philip mused to angel-faced Aubrey. Well, good for them. In fact, he had to admit that Anna Spinelli and Grace Monroe were tailor-made for his brothers. It would only add to their strength as a family when it came time for the hearing on permanent guardianship of Seth. And marriage certainly appeared to suit them, even if the word itself gave him the willies. For himself, Philip much preferred the single life and all it its benefits. Not that he had much time to avail himself of all those benefits in the past few months. Weekends in St. Chris, surprising, surpri surprisingly homework, supervising homework assignments, pounding a haul together for the fledging boats by Quinn, dealing with the book for the new business, hauling groceries, all of which had somehow become his domain, cramped a man's style. He promised his father on his deathbed that he would take care of Seth. With his brothers, he'd made a pact to move back to the shore to share the guardianship and the responsibilities for Philip. That pact meant splitting his time between Baltimore and St. Chris and his energies between maintaining his career and his co income, tending to a new and often problematic brother in a new business. It was all risk. 
Raising a 10-year-old wasn't without headaches and fumbling mistakes under the best of circumstances, he imagined. Set the Lautner raised by a part-time hooker, a full-time junkie, an amateur and extortionist had hardly come through the best of circumstances. Getting a boat-building enterprise off the ground was a series of irksome details and back-breaking labor, yet somehow it was working, and if he discounted the ridiculous demands on his time and energy, it was working fairly well. Not so long ago, his weekends had been spent in the company of any number of attractive, interesting women, having dinner at some new hot spot, an evening at the theater, or a concert, and if the chemistry was right, a quick Sunday brunch in bed. He'd, he'd get back to that, Philip promised himself once. All the details were in place, he would have his life back again. But as his father would have said, for the next little while, he turned into the drive. The rain had stopped, leaving a light sheen of wet on the leaves and grass. Twilight was creeping in. He could see the light in the living room window glowing in a soft and steady welcome. Some of the summer flowers that Anna had babied along with hanging on, were hanging on. And early fall blooms shimmered in the shadows. He could hear the puppy barking through in nine months. Though at nine months, foolish had grown too big and slick to be considered a puppy anymore. It was Anna's night to cook, he remembered. Thank God, and then a real meal would be served at the quince. He rolled his shoulders, thought about pouring himself a glass of wine, then watched Foolish dash from out the side of the house and pursued up a mangy yellow tennis ball. Thought of Philip getting out of his car, obviously distracted the dog from the game. He skidded to a halt and set up a din of wild, terrifying bark. Idiot. But he grinned as he pulled his briefcase out of the jeep. The familiar voice, the barking, turned into a maid. Mad joy. Fuller pounded up with a delight look in his eyes and wet, muddy paws. No jumping. Philip yelled using his briefcase like a shot. I mean it's it. Fuller squibbered, but dropped his rump on the ground, lifted a paw. His tongue lobbed in his eyes. That's a good dog. Gingerly, Philip shook the filthy paw and scratched the dog's silky ears. Hey, Seth wandered in the front yard. His jeans were grubby from wrestling with the dog. His baseball cap was askew, so the straw straight blonde hair spiked out a bit. The smile, Philip noted, came much more quickly and easier than it had a few months before, but there was a gap in him. Hey, Philip put a finger on the bill of a cap. Lose some. Huh? Philip tapped a finger against his own straight white teeth. Oh, yeah. Typical Quinn shrugged. Seth grinned, pushed his tongue into the gap. His face was fuller than it had been six months before, and his eyes less worry. It was loose. Had to give it a yank a couple of days ago. But like a son of a bitch, Philip didn't bother to sigh over Seth's language. Some things he determined weren't going to be his problem. So did the tooth fairy bring you anything? Get real. Hey, if you didn't squeeze a buck out of Cam, you're no brother of mine. I got two bucks out of it, one from Cam and one from Ethan. <laughs> Laughing, Philip swung an arm over Seth's shoulders, headed toward the house. Well, <clears throat> you're not getting one out of me, pal. I'm on to you. How was the first full week of school? Boring. Though it hadn't been, Seth admitted silently. It had been exciting. All the new junk Anna had taken him shopping for. Sharp pencils, black notebooks, blank notebooks, pencil of ink. She used the X-File lunchbox she wanted to get him. Only a door carried a lunchbox in middle school. But it had been really cool and tough to sneer at. He had cool clothes and bitchin' sneakers. And best of all, for the first time in his life, he was in the same place, the same school, with the same people he left behind in June. Homework. Bill Bash raising his eyebrows as he opened the front door. Seth Morris, man, don't you ever think about get anything else? Kid, I live for homework, especially when it's yours. Phyllis burst through the door ahead of Philip, nearly knocking him down with enthusiasm. Still got some work to do on that dog. But the mild annoyance faded instantly. He could smell Anna's red sauce simmering like a moosh on the air. God bless us, everyone, he murmured. Mancinoli, Seth informed. Yeah, I've got a shot. Nay, hey, I've been saving just for this moment. He tossed the previous with the books after dinner. He found a sister in law in the kitchen, filling pasta tubes with cheese. The sleeves of the crisp white shirt she'd worn to the office were rolled up, and a white butcher's apron covered her navy skirt. She'd taken off her heels and tapped her bare foot to the bead of area she was humming. Carmen, Philip recognized. He wondered. <sighs> Her wonderful mass of curly black hair was still pinned up. The wicked sack fiddle came up behind her, caught her around the waist, and pressed a noisy kiss on the top of her head. Run away with me. We'll change your names. You can be Sophia, and I'll be Carlo. Let me take you to paradise, where you can cook for me and me alone. None of these peasants appreciate you like I do. Let me just finish this too, Carlo, and I'll go pack. She turned her head, her dark Italian eyes like, dinner in 30 minutes. I'll open the wine. 
Don't we have anything to eat now? Says one of them. There's Anna Pasta in the fridge. She told him, go ahead and get it out. It's just vegetables and junk. Says Capir complained when he pulled out the bar. Yep. Jeez. Wash the dog off your hands before you start on that. Dogs spit cleaner than people spit. That's important. I read how if you get bit by another guy, it's worse than getting bit by a dog. I'm thrilled to have that fascinating tidbit of information. Wash the dog spit off your hands anyway. Man, disgusted Seth clomped out. The foe was slicking away after him. Philip chose the wine from a small supply he kept in the pantry. Fine wines were one of his passions, and his palate was extremely discriminating. His apartment in Baltimore boosted an extensive and carefully chosen selection, which he kept in a closet he remodeled specifically for that purpose. At the shore, his beloved bottles of Brunei and Burger and Donny kept company with Rice Krispies and a box of Jello instant pudding. He learned to live with it. So how was your week? So how was your week? He asked Anna. Busy? Whoever said women can have everything should be shot. And only a career in a family is grueling. Then she looked up with a brilliant smile. I'm loving it. It shows. Drew the cork expertly, sniffing and improved, and set the bottle on the counter to breathe. Where's Cam? Should be on his way home from the boatyard. He and Ethan wanted to put in an extra hour. The first boat by Quinn is finished. The owner's coming in tomorrow. It's finished, Philip, her smile flashed, brilliant and glow glowing with pride. At dock, seaworthy and just gorgeous. <laughs> he felt a little tug of disappointment that he hadn't been home the last day. We should be having champagne. Anna lifted her bro. She studied the label one. A bottle for Le Rufu? He considered one of Anna's finest traits to be her appreciation for a good one. Seventy-five, he said with a You weren't here. You won't hear any complaints from me. Congratulations, Mr. Quinn, on your first boat. It's not my deal. I just handle the details and pass for slave, slave labor. Of course it's your deal. Deals, details are necessary. Neither Cam nor Ethan can handle them with the fine, finesse you do. I think the word they use is nagging. They, they need to be nagged. You should be proud of what the three of you have accomplished in the last few months. Not just the new business, but the family. Each of you has given up something that's important to you for Seth. And each one of you has gotten something important back. I never expect the kids to matter so much. Well, Anna smothered the... Filled tubes with sauce, Philip opened the cupboard for wine glasses. I still have moments when the whole thing pisses me off. That's only natural, Philip. This would make me feel any better about it. He shrugged his shoulders in dismissal, then poured two glasses. But most of the time, I look at him and think, he's a pretty good deal for a kid brother. And a great grated cheese over the crash row. Out of the corner of her eyes, she watched Philip lift his glass, appreciate the bouquet. He was beautiful to look at. She moves physically. He was as close to male perfection as she could imagine. Bronze hair, thick and full, eyes more gold than brown. His face was long, narrow, thoughtful, both sensual and angelic. His tall, trim build seemed to have been fashioned for Italian suits. But since she'd seen him stripped to the waist and faded Levi's, she knew there was nothing soft about him. Sophisticated tough, her rooted, shrewd, an interesting man, she mused. She slipped the casserole into the oven, then turned to pick up her wine, smiling at him. She tapped her glass and, You're a pretty good deal, too, Philip, for a big brother. She leaned and kissed him lightly as Cam walked in. Get your mouth off, get your mouth off my wife. Philip merely smiled and slid an arm around Anne's waist. She put hers on me. She likes me. She likes me better. The proof of Cam hooked the hand in the tie of the hand and his apron, spun her around, pulled her into his arms, and kissed her brainless. He grinned, nipped her bottom lip, patted her butt companion. Don't you, sugar? <laughs> her head was still spinning. Probably. She blew out. <laughs> All things considered. But she was you're filthy. Just came in to grab a beer to take into the shower. Long and lean, dark and dangerous. He prowled over his reach and kissed my wife. He had it was a smug look of Phil. Go get your own woman. Who has time? Philip said mournfully. After dinner and an hour spent slaving over long division, battles of the Revelation War, sixth grade vocabulary, Philip settled down in his room with his laptop and his files. The same room he'd been given when Ray and Stella Quinn had brought him home. The walls had been a pale green then. Sometime during his sixteenth year, he got in a wild hair and painted them magnetite. Good God, who I remember that his mother. He remembered that his mother, Fristella, had become his 
mother by then had taken one look and warned him he'd have terminal indigestion. He thought it was sexy for about three months. Then he got on with a stark white for a while. Actually, then with moody black flame, black and white photographs. Always looking for ambiance. Philip thought now, amused at himself. So go back to the soft green right before he moved to Baltimore. They've been right all along, he suppose. His parents had usually been right. They'd given him this room, in this house, in this place. He hadn't made it easy for him. The first three months were a battle of wheels. He smuggled in drugs, picked fights, stole liquor, and stumbled in drunk at dawn. It was clear to him now that he'd been testing them, daring them to kick him out, toss him back. Go ahead, he thought. You can't handle me. But they did. They had not only handled him, they had made him. I wonder, Philip. His father said, why you want to waste a good mind and a good body? Why you want to let the bastards win? Philip, who was suffering from the raw gut and rusting head of a drug and alcohol hanging over, didn't give a goddamn. Ray took him out on the boat, telling him that a good sail would clear his head. Sick as a dog! Philip leaned over the rail, throwing up the remnants of the poison he pumped into his system the night before. Just turned fourteen. Ray anchored the boat in a narrow gut. He held Philip's head, wiped his face, and offered him a cold can of it. Sit down. He didn't so much as sit as collapse. His hands shook, his stomach shuddered at the first sip from the can. Ray sat across from him, his big hands on his knees, silver and hairy falling in a light breeze, and his eyes, the brilliant blue eyes, lovered and sing. You've had a couple months now to get your bearings around here. Stella says you've come around physically strong and healthy enough that you aren't going to stay that way if you keep this up. Percy's lips said nothing for a long moment. There was heroin in the tall grass, heroin in the tall grass, still was painting. The air was bright and chill. With late fall, the trees bare of leaves so that the hard blue sky spread overhead. Wind ruffled the grass and skimmed fingers over the water. The man sat, apparently content with the silence at the sea, and the boy slouched, pale face and hard to believe. We can play this a lot of ways, Phil. May suddenly, we can be hard asses. We can put you on a short leash, watch you every minute, and bust your balls every time you screw up, which is most of the time. Considering Ray picked up a fishing rod, absolutely baited him with a marshmallow. Well, we can all just say that this little experiment's a bust, and can, you can go back into the system. Felix's stomach churred. Megan swallowed to hold down what he didn't quite recognize as fear. I don't need you. I don't need you anyway. Yes, you do. Ray said it mildly as he dropped the line into the water. Ripple spread endlessly. You, can, you go back into the system. You'll stay there. A couple years down the road, it won't be JV anymore. You'll end up a cell with the bad guys. The kind of guys you are going to take a real liking to that pretty face of yours. Some seven-foot calm with hands like smoked hams. <laughs> it's going to grab you. The shadows one fine day and make you his bride. Philip yearned desperately for a cigarette. The image conjured by Ray's words made fresh sweet pop out. Fresh sweat pop out of his word. I can take care of myself. Son. Son. They pass you around like canopies, and you know it. You talk a good game, and you fight a good fight, but some things are inevitable. Up to this point, your life has pretty much sucked. You're not responsible for that, but you are responsible for what happens from here on. Fell into silence again, clapping the pole between his knees. Before reaching for a cold can of Pepsi, taking his time, Ray popped the top, tipped the can back, and goes, Stell and I thought we saw something in the We still do. Yeah, I'd look at Philip again. But until you do, we're not going to get anywhere. <laughs> what do you care? Phil <laughs> tossed back. Me. Hard to say at the moment. Maybe you're not worth it. Maybe you'll just end up back on the streets. Have some marks and turn tricks again. For three months, he'd had a decent bed, regular meals, and all the books he could read. One of his secret loves <laughs> at his disposal. At the thought of losing it, his throat filled up, but he only shrugged. I'll give by. If all you want to do is get by, that's your choice. Yeah, you can have a home, a family, you can have a life to make something out of it, or you can go on the way you are. Ray reached over to Phillips quickly, and the boy braced himself for the blow. Clenched his fist, returned, but Ray only pulled Phillips' shirt up, exposed his livid scar. You can go back to that, he said quietly. Philip looked into Ray's eyes. He saw compassion and hope. And he saw himself mirrored back, fleeing in a dirty gutter on the street where life was worth less than a dime bag. Sick, tired, terrified, Philip dropped his head into his hands. What's the point? You're the point, son. Ray ran his hand over Philip. You're the point. 
Things hadn't changed overnight, Phil thought now, but they had begun to change. His parents had made him believe in himself, despite himself. It had become a point of pride for him to do well in school, to learn, to remake himself as Philip Quinn. He figured he'd done a good job of it. He coded... He coded that street kid with a sheen of class. He had a slick career, a well-appointed condo with a killer view of the inner harbor, and a wardrobe that suited both. It seemed that he'd come full circle, spending his weekends back in his room with his green walls and sturdy furniture, with his windows that overlooked the trees in the march. This time, Seth was the point. End of chapter one.